Amen. Aren't you glad for God's faithfulness? And his blessing. Praise his wonderful name. Uh, today we are uh, honored to have uh, some special guests with us. And uh, one thing that I forgot to say at the beginning of the service is that you all are invited to Thanksgiving dinner. Not at my house, but in God's house, right at the end of the service today. We have 40 pounds of turkey that needs to be eaten, and rolls, and dressing, and gravy, and potatoes, and salads, and desserts. So don't anybody go home. Y'all, well, y'all are welcome to stay. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we are today privileged to have Daryl and Verna Stanton as uh, visiting missionaries. They are missionaries to Kenya, and they are spending uh, this time, is it a whole year? Three months? Okay, it's three months uh, on what the, what's called furlough, and uh, basically what furlough is, there's a little kid one time that asked the question, somebody asked him what he would be like, what, someone would ask a little child what he would like to be when he grow up, and he said, I'd like to be a missionary on furlough. Well, the impression in his mind was that missionaries on furlough didn't do anything. No, 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 no. Missionaries on furlough spend that entire time almost telling the story of what God is doing in their lives and in their communities and in their locations. And so that's what the Stantons, last night they were in Ottawa, uh, Illinois, and they got into town last night about 11 and were here about 9 this morning. Uh, getting set up ready for today's service and I think are you going on to Dixon tonight is that right so uh, these folks are very busy but it's a privilege for us to have them here again as I mentioned at the beginning of the service we will be receiving our uh, our regular offering as well as our Thanksgiving offering at the end uh, of the service and so uh, would you please welcome Daryl and Verna Stanton good morning yeah with these first two rows there's plenty of room room here. Come on, come on, come on. Yes. It's nice to be here in Rock Island, Illinois. We were here, we drove through here on Monday when we were in Moline, and then we've been back and forth across the Illinois River. Now I'm told that it was the Rock River that we were staying by um, last night, but Thank you, it's good to be here with you. Now, uh, we like to tell the kids stories, and this story is like a parable. A parable that's in the Bible means it's a story with a lesson, okay? And this is about some African animals, okay? So, now, those aren't real, you can't eat them. The animals in our story aren't real either, but we're going to learn a story from them, okay? Now, there's three animals, three kinds of animals in our story today. We're going to learn about an antelope that's called an impala. They are very beautiful, and we have, we have a little um, purse back on the table back there that has impala skin on it, so you'll be able to see that afterwards if you haven't seen it already. And you're welcome to come back there and touch and handle all that stuff. An impala and his family and a lion and a rabbit and there's a story about this for us now this is a story that um, is about an impala and his family now in an impala family there's one male and a lot of females and their their kids you know the, the little ones so this was a young impala and he liked to do what he liked do. Anybody like that here? He liked to do what he liked to do. Yeah? You're being very honest. But sometimes we don't get to do what we like to do because our mothers tell us something else, right? And the Impala family lived on a hill. Now, you have some hills in Illinois, so you have to imagine you're on a hill, and there's a valley down below, and the Impala, they eat grass, you know, antelope deer, they eat grass. He looked down the hill and he saw 
that there was nice grass down there in the valley. In fact, he didn't like the grass up where he was at. He didn't like it at all. So he said, Mom, can I go down to the valley? And his mom said, No, you cannot go down to the valley. So he asked her, what do you think he asked her? Exactly. Why? And she said, Because there's a lion down there in the valley. So this impala, we're going to give him the name, the stubborn one. But the stubborn one in English is too long. We're going to call him the Swahili name, which is Mtukutu. Can you say that? Mtukutu. Say it again. Mtukutu. Now you remember that name. Mtukutu, the stubborn one. He wanted to go down to eat that grass down there because it was better. He was sure it was better than what he had up on the hill. So he started watching down there in the valley to see if there was a lion down there. He didn't see a lion the first day, the second day, the whole week. And the next week, he never saw a lion, and he kept watching. And anyway, there were even other antelope down there, not from his family, but other antelope. So he asked his mom again, can I go down there? She said, no, because there's a lion down there. And he said, I don't see a lion down there. And so one day when his mother wasn't watching, he ran down the hill and went down to the valley and started eating the grass. Then he looked around. He didn't see a lion. And he ate some more grass. And there were other antelopes, so he wasn't worried at all. But, you know, in his eager uh, pursuit to eat so much grass, he got a little further and further away from all the other antelope. They were, they were there, but then he got further and further and further and further because he was eating the green grass, and he forgot to pay any attention. And suddenly, the lion, who had been watching him, pounced, and she got him. And she killed him. And in Tukutu, he died. Well, they tell us, you know, it's always a female lion that does the hunting. It's not the males. They tell us that a female hunt, hunter, after she gets done uh, hunting, she has to uh, take a little nap because she's tired from her hunt and her pursuit. So she dozed. And while she was dozing, a little rabbit came by. Now, um, in this story, the rabbit was hungry and wanted to eat part of the antelope. But the rabbit was also afraid of the lion. And so the rabbit decided, I will just eat Mtukutu's ears, and the lion will never know the difference. So the rabbit came up, ate the ears off of Mtukutu, the impala, and then went back and uh, was running away. When the lion woke up, the lion said, Rabbit, you ate some of this antelope. And the rabbit lied and said, No, I didn't. And the lion said, Yes, you did. You ate the ears of this impala. There are no ears on this impala. And the rabbit said, Oh, that's because this impala had no ears. And the lion said, Yes, he did. And you ate them. And the, and the rabbit said, No, he didn't have any ears. In fact, you just ask his mother up there on the hill if her son had any ears. So the lion looked up, and the mother was looking down very sad because her son, Mtukutu, was dead. And the lion said, did your son have any ears? And the mother said, no, my son didn't have any ears. Because if he would have had ears, he would have listened to me, and he wouldn't have gone down to the valley in the first place. You get that. I am so glad. You are bright. And you know, Jesus said in the Bible, remember this is a parable, it's a message, and that Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did M. Tukutu have ears to hear? No, he didn't have ears to hear, and that's what you get. So the rabbit who lied in the story ate his physical ears, but he had no real ears. And so the message for us is today, there's a verse in the Bible that I like to read, and it comes from 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 and the verse says it's first peter chapter 5 verse 8 and the verse says be self-controlled and alert not like him to kutu your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour 
1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Was there a roaring lion in this story? Well, she was silent. She didn't roar at the first because she was on her prey. The roaring lion is the male lion, and he roars other times when they're not hunting. Otherwise, the animals would run away. But Mtukutu didn't run away because he was too busy doing what he wanted to do, eating grass. Now, some of us, we kind of do what we want to do sometimes, don't we? And then we don't obey those in our authority, like your parents, like maybe the pastor, your teachers, or even Jesus. But I'm hoping that you will take a lesson from the story and you won't be like Mtukutu. Anybody want to be like Mtukutu? Oh, good. We don't have anybody who wants to be like that. Oh, oh you sure you want to be like Mtukutu? He died, remember. So, if you think of being disobedient, maybe you'll remember Mtukutu and remember that uh, he didn't have a very good ending because he didn't have any ears. Now, we're going to teach you a song. We live in Kenya, and we have learned another language called Swahili. Now, there might be a song that you know in English. I don't know. Some of these people back here will probably know that song. It's called Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. You've heard that song? I can hear some of you singing it. If you didn't know it, you'll get to learn it today. Now, we're not going to sing it in English. We're going to sing it in Swahili. But the good news is, hallelujah is still the same because that's from the Hebrew word, and we all use hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. So we're going to be singing praise the Lord throughout the whole song. But we'll be doing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Sifuni is one word for you all praise him. Can you say sifuni? Sifuni. And then the word for Lord is buana. Buana. So we're going to sing sifuni buana. Hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Now, anybody who learned the song knows that usually we stand up when it's our part to sing. And so we're going to have the guys start on hallelujah. The guys are going to stand up. And then the ladies are going to stand up when you sing Sifuni Buana. Okay. Now, shh. If you don't feel like you can stand, it doesn't apply to these two rows. If you cannot stand, you can raise your hand the next time for hallelujah, gentlemen. And ladies, if you can't stand, you can raise your hand for Sifu Ni Buana, okay? You all get to stand, okay? You all get to stand. Okay, so the guys are going to start. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Sifu Ni Buana. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Sifu Ni Buana. Sifu Ni Buana. Sifuni buana. Hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Hallelujah. Sifuni buana. Good. Now it's the ladies' turn. The ladies' turn to sing hallelujah. And the guys' turn to sing Sifuni buana. Now, back there, I don't see some people standing or raising your hand. We can all praise the Lord here, okay? Yeah, no restrictions. Okay, ladies, stand up. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. See? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 can go.
go join your parents again? Oh, you are fine. Okay, are you all awake? Did you notice we were singing loudly? We wanted you to sing loudly. And the praise team, you were praising the Lord loudly, weren't you? Um, you didn't have to tone down your guitar, your keyboard. There was no reason to, to sing We didn't have to sing that way, did we? Because we have freedom in this country. Freedom that there are many people in the world today who do not have freedom. They don't have the freedom to come to church in a big group like this and shout praises to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Well, we didn't really shout. We sang, but we really weren't shouting. But we could have if we wanted. By the time we sang Sifuni Buana, I think we were almost shouting. We are very blessed. And yet today is the day we're to remember the persecuted church. Now we're from Kenya, African Nazarene University. And African Nazarene University has been there since 1994. We had our first graduating class in 1998, and every year the graduating class gets bigger as we have more and more students that come. Myself, I teach health. It's a required class. I'm a nurse by trade. And we have two textbooks, Where There Is No Doctor and the Bible and we put, apply the Bible to health. There are a lot of verses in, in uh, Proverbs and Psalms and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all through the Bible about health. In fact, I've even used this verse that we had today about be um, watchful, sober, and vigilant because the devil seeks whom he may devour, and that is for spiritual health, and we talked about that today in our lesson, but we have physical health too, and mental health, and social health, and environmental health. We have all of those that we talk about holistic health. And we want to train our people, our students, that come in to be as healthy as they can so they can go out and serve God. The fact of the matter is, African Nazarene University, since 1994, has been training African leaders. And there are two flags in this room from Africa. And both of them, one from Zimbabwe, and back there, the, the, the second one behind the Christian flag from Sudan. We have had students from African Nazarene University graduate from each of those countries. In fact, our chaplain right now is from Zimbabwe, that country there. We have trained leaders from all over Africa. What does that mean? We have six field strategy coordinators in Africa. Three of them have graduated from African Nazarene University. We have six DSs in Kenya, and four of them have graduated from Nazarene University. We have missionaries that are African missionaries. They have, some have come from Kenya, and one couple has come from the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have come to African Nazarene University to get trained and to learn uh, more about their faith and to get competent in their jobs. And now they are missionaries in Tanzania, Malawi, and Congo. The fact of the matter is African Nazarene University is training leaders for Africa and other places. We even have a student from African Nazarene University in Kansas City right now who's pastoring the church while he's at seminary. He feels a call to be a missionary, and I don't know where God will send him and his wife. The fact of the matter is you are helping in your mission offering. You are going to take a missions offering today, a Thanksgiving offering. Your goal is 3500 according to the bulletin board back there. That's a lot of money. But the fact is... You are helping to train leaders. We're talking about the persecuted church today briefly. African Nazarene University is training leaders from many countries. We know for a fact that we have about 18 uh, countries represented at the university between 15 and 20. And people have gone out to those countries and they are spreading the gospel. Some are business people and some are pastors and some are teachers and they're going out and spreading the good news. 
My husband and I, we told the teens we were called to be missionaries when we were kids, only 10 years of age. Any 10-year-olds here? Yeah, I see a couple, three hands. We felt God's call on our life to become missionaries when we were 10 years of age. And then we went to Olivet Nazarene University. We met and we planned to go out. We were sent to Zambia in 1982. We had a four-year-old son, a two-year-old daughter, and our daughter Rachel was born the next year in Zambia. So she has a Zambian passport. She could have, she has a Zambian birth certificate. She chose to have an American passport. She's now married to a young man and lives in Kansas. Our daughter Katrina is working at Southern Nazarene University. She's in Oklahoma City, and our son Philip is in Virginia and he's um, a household manager. My husband's father's in Michigan and my sister's in Colorado. So where are we from? Kenya. We feel comfortable there because we have lived in East Africa since 1992 and we've lived in Kenya since 1997. And now we're at the university, both of us, since 2003. Many young people are being trained. We have some students right now that are feeling God's call to go to people in a persecuted country, a country where it's illegal to be a Christian, a country where you can declare, I'm a Christian, but if you do, they are likely to kill you that time. So most of the people don't go around with wearing crosses. I'm wearing my cross today, but they don't do that. They don't go around with a badge saying, I'm a Christian. They don't go around singing, shout to the Lord. No, they don't do that. They have to be very quiet, a secret Christian. And when somebody finds out, they can be at risk of their lives. Does that mean we don't have any work there? No, that does not mean that. It means we still have work, but it's underground. And we have people who are willing to go in and spread the gospel because they want their fellow men and women to know about Jesus and to know that Jesus is the only promise that we can have and to know that hope. My husband and I are white. I have blue eyes. Unless I covered myself up entirely, they would know immediately by looking at my skin, I'd even have to wear gloves, that I was white. I w we wouldn't be able to get a visa to some of those countries because uh, those countries don't like Americans and what America stands for. So they would refuse us a visa. So how in the world can the gospel spread to those countries? through African Nazarene University. The Africans will be able to get there. The Africans will be able to get the visas to get in. And the internet's there too to help spread the gospel. African Nazarene University, we have missionaries, we have leaders in Africa and in Kenya, and we have people called to go to the persecuted church. We thank you for sending us. Your Thanksgiving offering pays our salary so we can go there and spread the good news, even in health class, and teach people that God is real, and he's still changing lives, and they get called, and they go out to the world, not an easy world, a world where they may be persecuted, but they're willing to go if God calls them. I call it that you are covering our backs. You know those TV movies where the police say, cover my back, I'm going in? You're covering our backs while we go in and teach at African Nazarene University. And then we have to cover those people's lives with prayer that are going into the persecuted areas. African Nazarene University is standing on the edge of training leaders for the 1040 window in Africa and out of Africa. The gospel, well, the darkness is turning to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. In Christ's great kingdom, it's coming to earth, the kingdom of love and light in Africa and the world beyond. Thank you for all you're doing for world missions, and God bless you. And you're not getting two sermons for the price of one, but I'm going to say a few words, too. Um, I wanted to share with you just a few things about the display. Some of you have been out there already, and you've grabbed a prayer card. Please pray for us and we know that you're taking a thanksgiving offering to help support us financially but also uh, remember that we need your prayers uh, we're doing god's work and that means we have to keep in communication with god and all of you uh, praying on our behalf helps support us in that way mostly 
So uh, take a card and pray for us. I also have some business cards there if you'd like to communicate with us by email or look at our webpage. Verna is our quality control person for the webpage, and if you see something that can you think will contribute and make our page better, uh, send her an email and, and let us know. I wanted to share with you also, though, uh, my life ministry verse. It comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 6. I shared with the teens uh, from another chapter and verse this morning in Sunday school, but I wanted to share this life verse with you this morning. In simple English, I'm reading from a translation of the Bible called what? Teenagers? Habari and jema kwawatu wote, right? And we said that means good news for everybody version of the Bible. And in verse 6, it says the gospel keeps bringing blessings and is spreading throughout the world. How many countries is the Church of the Nazarene spreading the gospel to? 156. And we know that um, even some of the countries, if you look at the report that we have uh, for Africa, we have most of the countries in Africa are colored in according to the fields that we are having our administration for. And then we have a number of them, uh, especially in the northern part of Africa, that are white. Those are countries that are more creative access, that we have maybe people who go there and visit, and maybe we can have a, a business person go in and work with them and try to be a witness on the side. But we are spreading to almost all over Africa. Why? The gospel keeps spreading. But as it spreads, it's giving blessings. We went to Africa in 19 what? Teens? 82, yes. And I have spent half of my life in Africa. So how old am I? 58. Good. The teens are on the ball this morning in class. Thank you. Give them a hand. And we've been able to share the blessings because you sent us. And my wife mentioned we went when uh, we were young. We were 29. And we were called when we were very young at 10. And we've been a part of sharing the blessings of the gospel in Africa. When we went to Africa, though, in 1982, we had 30,000 members. And most of them were in southern Africa. And we had a few in Cape Verde Islands in the northwest. Does anybody know how many members we have in Africa today? Any guesses? Well, we had tried, we had been praying, we had been working to have a half, a, a whole million by the end of last year, and we missed it. We actually have a little over a half a million. And we were disappointed at the end of 2010 when we discovered we'd only got a little over halfway. And then we remembered there's a program in South America called Each One Win One. Does anybody know that program? Essentially, that means if all of us as Nazarenes will do our part, if we will be a faithful witness, if we will uh, select some people from our family, our friends, our neighbors who need the Lord, and we present those uh, names before the church and we pray over them, at the end of the year, it's possible for each of us to have done our part in winning somebody to the Lord. And, and we said in Africa, we can do that too. And so, in this year, 2011, we're trying to have a push for each Nazarene in Africa to win another one so that we can reach our what? Our million. Why? That's simple math, isn't it? If we have a half a million and each Nazarene wins another one, we can win our, our million. Now, it isn't quite that uh, we can do our part and be faithful witnessing, but it is God who wins, isn't it? and is God who brings salvation uh, in a person's life. But as a church, we don't actually accept them into full membership until they say they're saved, and we've done some discipling, and we bring them through a membership class, and then we present them to the church. So it isn't that easy to bring it up to a million. But we're doing our part as a church to do that. Why? Because we want to bring blessings. Verna mentioned some of the ways the church is bringing blessings. I wanted to mention, she told a story 
uh, from this red book, and we have a copy on the display out there. Uh, we've been involved as missionaries in writing some books for Africa. Uh, we had an emphasis a few years ago, books for pastors. And so this little book was given to all the pastors in Eastern Africa and even on the Horn of Africa. And it's a collection of African parables and traditional stories. And my wife, of course, because she's a nurse, has put a little bit of a, a health twist on them as well as some scripture. And even some of the churches are using them for Sunday school lessons because they relate well to them. Why we want to be able to help Africans to use their stories to pass on the blessings of God in the church. I also wrote a book uh, for pastors, for the books for pastors, uh, called An Introduction to Wesleyan Holiness Theology in Everyday English. Sometimes as a, a, a theologian or a teacher, I can make things very complex, but we wanted to, to have what Nazarenes believe very simple, and even uh, junior highs, uh, young people uh, can read that book and understand. And many of our pastors are using English as a second or third or fourth language. And so we've tried to write it in very simple. Why? We want the gospel to keep bringing blessings. Thank you for sending us as your missionaries. You've been a blessing in Africa. Thank you for praying for us and being willing to send us back to the field so that we can continue being a blessing in Africa. We will be around uh, for a little while after the service at the display. And we enjoy to, uh, we think we will enjoy some of that turkey with you, Pastor. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Amen. It is amazing and wonderful what God is doing in so many ways. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on, by, come on up. Uh, we're going to uh, have prayer here in a moment, and then we are going to receive our offering. So ushers, if you'll be ready to help us out. Also, the, um, uh, the connection cards, if you will place them in the offering plate, we'd appreciate that very, very much. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the privileges, as far as I'm concerned, of being part of the Church of the Nazarene is that as a church, we support the livelihood for our missionaries. Uh, and that's, to me, that's one of the big bonuses for us. And we are... Uh, um, Thankful for the opportunity to participate in our Thanksgiving offering, which helps in uh, what's called the World Evangelism Fund. In fact, I think on the, on the envelope that we gave you, it says the season of Thanksgiving, Church of the Nazarene World Evangelism Fund. And uh, we will uh, count this uh, shortly after the service so that we can kind of give everybody a, a, at least a preliminary total uh, during the dinner sometime. Uh, so ushers, would you please come, and we will uh, have a word of prayer, and then we will um, receive our offering today. Thank you in advance for what you're doing, and for how you're participating, and for uh, being a part of this great global family uh, in the Church of the Nazarene. Father in heaven today, we glorify and honor your name, and we thank you for the privilege that we have of sharing what you have so richly blessed us with um, for the cause of the advancing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, all over the world, the gospel is taking root and is being cultivated and it is, uh, it is flourishing and there is a mighty harvest. So Lord, today as we give our Thanksgiving offering, we give it as a farmer plants seeds in the ground. And when it is combined with others, there truly will be an abundant harvest. So, Father, we thank you today for this privilege. Thank you for the opportunity that we have also to give of our tithes. Uh, that is the foundation of who we are as a, a church, and who we are as a movement. And we thank you for uh, the faithful giving of tithes and offerings. And so, God, today, as we, um, as we participate in this offering, we thank you for the message that we have heard and for the way in which you are blessing uh, in so many different ways. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the African people who are being trained at African Nazarene University and then are going out into their homelands to share the good news of Jesus. And, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be a part of that today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing.